the feds and C++ to start with. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that usually surprise people and uh, why they're there and why they perhaps shouldn't be as surprising as they often seem to be. Uh, so the threads in C++, well, threads, the thread support is one of these features that, as uh, sort of Alex would probably say, is something that not, that not everybody needs to know about. On the other hand, many of us in the uh, what we call processes and so on do need to deal with running multiple things in parallel on one machine, or we need to deal with user input, user input while something else is going on. So we are, we are often interested in using threads from C++. And, uh, before the C++ learned effort, the story there was highly unsatisfactory in that the language itself didn't support threads. If you wanted to program with threads, you needed to use some extra library. And this wasn't functionality that really could be completely supplied by a library, so we sort of bundled through. However, in C++ 11, things are finally different. So we finally do have thread support in the language, meaning that we have a threads API, we have ways to create threads, uh, we have ways to synchronize them, of course, we'll see it really quickly here. And uh, from my perspective, the part that I was most interested in is we actually have a consistent story as to what shared variables mean, which has been a sore spot in the past in, in dealing with C or C++ and, and, uh, and threads. And it turns out that in order to make sense out of what shared variables mean, we actually needed to introduce something that wasn't commonly supported before, which are so-called atomic, atomic variables or atomic operations. Uh, so here's sort of an example, if you haven't seen it before, the kinds of things you can do in, in C++ 11. And uh, this is probably, I don't know if Alex is in the room, uh, this, is, this is probably going to offend at least, uh, at least Alex and possibly Lawrence as well. This is a really terrible algorithm. Don't ever use this algorithm. I should say that ahead of time, but it's a commonly used illustration. So what we want to do here is we want to compute Fibonacci numbers recursively, which is a really bad idea. Uh, but we want to do that, we want to try to speed up this really bad algorithm by at least running different pieces of it in parallel, which is a silly idea, but nonetheless. <laughs> uh, so the way we can do that in C++ 11 is, first of all, we check for the base case, which is the same way it always was, the same way it always did. We, can, we then need to compute Fibonacci of n minus 1 and Fibonacci of n minus 2. We can compute Fibonacci of n minus 1 here by specifying a function which computes Fibonacci of n minus 1. There are other ways to do that, but a fairly common way to do this, a fairly easy way to do this in C11 is to define a new function inline and not just function inline using a lambda expression here, which is the argument to async. Then async runs it and uh, basically starts another thread, uh, runs it in parallel, <coughs> gives us back what's called a future that represents the result that will eventually be returned from this other thread. Uh, then while the thread is running, I compute Fibonacci of n minus 2 in my original <coughs> thread in parallel with the computation of Fibonacci of n minus 1. I then get the result from Fib 1 which has now been computed in parallel, I wait for it if it's not done by calling fib1.get. I add that to Fibonacci of n minus 2 and I return the result. So that's the one slide introduction to what uh, thread support look, might look like in C11. Uh, as I said, I was actually more interested in the treatment of shared variables, which are, sort of, which are inherent, an inherent part in building more interesting threads based programs. Uh, this has always been a soft spot in the past because uh, basically compiler writers and users traditionally didn't agree. So in C++ 11 and also in C11, as it turns out, they copied it from, from C++ 11 essentially. Uh, there now is a consistent story about how shared variables work. The story is sort of uh, summarized in one slide and removing some of the precision in the process, unfortunately, but it, things are precisely defined is that we first, we start by defining the notion of a data race. Uh, basically, a data race occurs if I access the same variable from two threads at the same time, uh, where one of those accesses is right. The language then says, where one of those accesses updates the variable. So with, in such a way that the ordering of those accesses actually matters. Um, the rule then is, if I write a program with the data race, all bets are off. So you should think of, your programming model should be, if you introduce a data race, 
uh, your computer will catch on fire, which is a little picture there. Uh, no, normally they refer to it as catch fire semantics, though that's hopefully not really going to happen. Uh, but you should think of it the same way that you think of uh, an out of bounds array access area. Basically, anything whatsoever can happen if you have a data race in your program. On the other hand, so long as you have no data races, things are sort of by default, at least, unless you tell us otherwise, things are fine. Uh, what, the way variables behave is exactly the same way you would expect, that in fact, uh, your program executes as though the steps of all the threads were just interleaved in some way. So there are no weird surprises. If you heard about memory fences and so on, you can forget all that stuff, things just work. Um, in fact, in some sense, things might work even better than people normally think of them working, because you not only do, can you think about the programs executing as though the fed steps are interleaved, you can, talk, you can think about uh, chunks of fed steps being interleaved. So if you have a sequence of, statement, a sequence of statements in one fed with no synchronization in the middle, uh, that behaves as though it executed indivisibly, atomically in one chunk. Nothing else can interfere with that. That's really a consequence of the fact that we outlaw databases, as it turns out. Uh, in so doing, in clarifying this model, we, have, we did end up making a bunch of common compiler optimizations, and that's perhaps sort of the, the first surprise here. But it turns out those compiler optimizations really needed to be broken because they're, they're not really compatible with any sort of reasonable programming practice. Uh, in order to prevent data races, we have several facilities in the language. Um, we, have a, we can declare mutexes, uh, which provide mutual exclusion between different threads. Uh, there's some nice uh, C++ syntax to make those easier to use. So typically, say if we want to increment a variable, a global variable X, and do it in such a way that it's it can be incremented for multiple threads without them stepping on each other, without them interfering or introducing a data race, uh, we do that by acquiring a mutex before we increment X, releasing it after, after we're done, and we typically do that by declaring a lockout, which acquires the mutex in, the, in its constructor and releases the mutex no matter what, even if an exception gets thrown or something like that. Uh, the other way we have of avoiding data races, which is really new in C++11, uh, is that uh, we, can, we can make variables or we can make objects in general atomic, which basically tells the compiler that I am going to violate the rules in some way, and I am, I am going to access these things concurrently in a way that actually would otherwise introduce a data race. But by making them atomic, they become exempt from data races. And in fact, certain operations become, operations on just that <coughs> variable normally become indivisible. So if I type X plus plus now, that actually results in an atomic increment. It doesn't result in loading X, adding one, and then storing it back. It indivisibly adds one to X. Uh, so, throughout all of this, I still sort of preserve, I still preserve the model that in the absence of data races, and again, atomics are, them, are themselves exempt from data races, uh, programs execute as though the instructions from the feds were just in uh, So here I have a simple example, which some of you have probably seen before. Uh, the, this is the core of Decker's mutual exclusion algorithm, if you know where that is. Uh, so each thread sets a global variable and then reads the other global variable. Uh, if I think of interleaving these steps, you can convince yourself easily that there can't be any way in which R1 and R2 can both be zero. Basically, if I think of executing steps from each thread, uh, one of the threads has to go first. Either X equals one or Y equals one has to go first, which means the other thread has to read a value of one. So having them both zero should not be possible. Uh, and uh, if they're declared atomic, so I don't have any data races, <coughs> the C++ 11 implementation has to make sure that this in fact works correctly and that that's impossible. That means the implementation has to do whatever is necessary to make that true. And if you know about memory fences and compiler optimizations and so on, you know that that's in fact quite a challenge, but it's something that the implementation has to take care of. Uh, 
once I want, not what comes to hell, I want to go to We can't have them both, we can't have them both zero. When? Uh, at the end. When they both complete. When I go off. Okay. Sorry. Because yeah. otherwise you can. It's a matter of being deleted, right? Uh, in the middle, they can initially get both zero. Right? Or, but no, yeah. but those are yeah. afterwards. They uh, but if they want to complete, uh, they can't both be a value of zero here in the, when they read x and y. Yes. After, after that, then. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now I wanted to say something, so as many of these as I have time to go through here, about some of the surprises that, uh, or things that people find surprising about the way that C11 handles this. Uh, so there's, there's sort of an interesting question here that keeps me occurring as part of the standardization process. Many people really view that the whole of standards committees, and especially some non C standards committees, view themselves as basically standardizing existing practice entirely. Meaning that by the time they get done, you shouldn't find anything surprising in the standard because if they did that, they obviously did something wrong. They standardized something that obviously wasn't existing practice. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at C11, especially in this area, there are a whole bunch, there are a bunch of surprises here. So I want to try to convince you that we're in fact uh, not as crazy as it first seems that these things actually make sense. Uh, so one of the surprises, and this in some sense is sort of the most embarrassing one probably to try to explain to people, so I'll start with the first so you'll forget it by the end hopefully, uh, is uh, Fed cancellation. So if you look at a lot, of, uh, a lot of Fed libraries in the past, there are ways to basically have one Fed tell another Fed to please stop as soon as possible and go away. I no longer need the result you're producing. Uh, it turns out POSIX has a way of doing that called pthread cancel. Uh, Java has something called thread.interrupt that does this. And these all have, well, they also have additional functionality, but both of these sort of have a core functionality that's actually useful. They also have, uh, in both cases, there's some added functionality that's not really useful. Uh, C11 has absolutely nothing in this area. In spite of the fact that basically the whole committee agreed that we really wanted something. Uh, it's better. It's better not have anything? Not get that. Okay, well, I'm the, uh, I think there's a the difference of, of opinion about that. Uh, the, uh, it turns out there's, a, there's, however, a fairly straightforward explanation of why we ended up with nothing. Uh, which is that there were basically sort of irreconcilable differences between two goals of preserving compatibility with our history, with various forms of our history. Uh, so on the, uh, on the POSIX side, there was a very strong feeling that cancellation, if you tell a thread to please go away, it shouldn't be able to notice, that, notice the fact that it's been told to go away and then just say no and keep running. So in fact, the POSIX API enforces that. There's no way, once you've noticed that you're supposed to go away, there's no way to return back to mainline code and, start and keep running as though nothing had happened. On the other hand, in C++, it turns out that that's actually not a reasonable thing to do. The only, way to, the only reasonable way to tell a thread to go away is to, to throw an exception, but exceptions by definition can be caught and they have to be catchable in order to make things work. Attempts to not make an exception catchable don't really work out. So in the end, there was actually no way to actually reconcile those two, and we couldn't arrive at any sort of conclusion. So that's probably sort of the, the most embarrassing surprise here for some people. Um, so here's a very different one, which actually also surprises some people, and there have been some discussions on the web People, with people who have been very upset at this, and that's how we handle infinite loops. It actually turns out this might be sort of <coughs> an interesting question, but people, especially in embedded systems, which are supposed to stay up forever, do care what infinite loops do. Uh, that actually turns out to be a surprisingly difficult question with threads. So to see that, uh, look if you look at the, the top, two loops here, and now see what happens when we run these loops in parallel with another thread that accesses Y. Uh, 
Uh, well, what happens if n is 1, which is sort of the typical case that you might expect on leaving those loops? Well, what happens is that 1 and that 2 have a data this. They can potentially both access y at the same time. That 1 will eventually start incrementing y, and that there's nothing to prevent that 2 from leading y while that, from that 2 from leading y while that 1 is still incrementing it. So these things have a data base. So with n equals 1, there's a data base. With n equals 0, oddly enough, there's no data base. The, the problem being that the first loop well, then the first loop runs forever because i is never incremented. Therefore, it never actually touches y. Therefore, this this thread never. Uh, therefore, this thread can merely go ahead and read y. Nobody else is touching it. So the problem now is, if we have a compiler optimizer and it sees those two loops, at least if we have a sufficiently clever optimizer, what it should really be considering doing is fusing those two loops into a single loop that increments x and y together in a single loop to avoid the loop overhead. The problem there now that the, is that the behavior here has changed. So uh, with n equals 1, we still have a data base. That's fine. That was the same way it was before. Uh, with n equals 0, we now also have a data base. Because this loop, unlike the original one, is still an infinite loop, but it's now incrementing y as well. Uh, so we change the behavior. And so as a result of that, this is actually, naively, one would think that this is not a valid transformation anymore in the presence of threads. And in fact, in, in fact, Java takes exactly that position and declares that to be a, uh, an invalid transformation. And there are perfectly good reasons to do that. Basically, cleaner semantics for the language suggests that that should be an invalid transformation. On the other hand, compiler out the desire to sort of get the most out of your compiler, to get the most performance out of your compiler, suggests that that should, uh, that, that should be a legal transformation, so we sort of have a trade-off here. Uh, it turns out this was actually kind of resolved in an interesting way. Uh, the observation that uh, some of us hadn't, weren't fully aware of at the beginning, and I think that many people were not aware of, is that the status quo here really was different from what people were assuming. If you look at existing compilers, they already did things like uh, potentially take, look at loops, which updated nothing in the loop, and remove that loop as a whole if they could prove that it had no side effects, whether or not they could prove that it actually terminated. Which had the effect that existing compilers already did things that were essentially unexplainable to infinite loops. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, this gave us an easy way out, essentially. Uh, so this C++ 11 solution is, consists of the text that I've written up here, uh, which basically summarizing it shortly says, don't write infinite loops. They have undefined semantics. Uh, there are some exceptions to, to that. If you write a loop which, which does I.O. in the loop, even if it's infinite, or does synchronize with other threads in the process, that's perfectly legitimate, and the compiler has to handle that correctly. But if it has no effects inside the loop, uh, if it has no interactions with anything else, that loop has undefined behavior, which has the effect that these transformations become legal again. Because if you wrote that loop with n equals 0, you were already violating the rules. Uh, so this allows loop optimizations. Unlike the older versions of the language, it actually has the positive effect that it allows you to write infinite loops if you do, if you want to. You now have a way to write them down, and it doesn't break existing code because compilers already broke it before. <laughs> uh, okay, going on to sort of another issue here that that often surprises people. Uh, this. C++ 11, along with many other languages, has a tie lock primitive, which allows you to tie to acquire a mutex. But if you can't immediately acquire it, uh, because, for example, because another thread already holds it, what you can, you're instead allowed to just return failure and say, I couldn't get it right now. You don't wait for the mutex. You don't wait for the other thread to finish. You just go ahead and say it's not, uh, it's not available at the moment. Uh, so you can, C++11 has that. Uh, using this primitive, 
I can write this really baroque piece of code, which sets x, which initializes x to some value, sets x to 42, and then indicates that it's done setting x by acquiring the lock, by acquiring the mutex. And here. The other thread, rather than waiting for the mutex to be available, waits for the mutex to no longer be available, concludes based on that, uh, that the thread one must have gotten to this point, and then notice as well, thread one is done setting x, so I can now use it, so it must be 42. And by the sort of kind of interleaving semantics that we would really like to be able to guarantee, normally we would have to assure that uh, this in fact works correctly. On the other hand, it turns out it's really expensive to assure that, to ensure that uh, for reasons that never matter for any, any reasonable code, I would argue. Uh, so as a result, uh, we basically wanted a way out of this. The problem is that in order to ensure this, I have to prevent the lock and x equals 42 here from being interchanged by the hardware, from the hardware to, to acquire the lock before it sets x to 42. It turns out on many pieces, on some hardware that doesn't matter, on other hardware, I have to insert another fairly expensive fence instruction, which takes many cycles in order to ensure this property that doesn't get in order. And I don't really want to do that. Uh, so we found a creative way out of this, which is sort of the surprising people, which is the thing that often surprises people. And that's that our official story here is that Tylock, uh, sorry about spelling it inconsistently here, uh, that time lock can fail, uh, can fail spuriously. So when you're programming at least, you should pretend that time lock can return a failure even when the lock is available. So that has the advantage that based on noticing time lock fail, uh, you can conclude absolutely nothing about its state. Uh, you can conclude absolutely nothing about what happened before because, in fact, this might be a spurious failure. So as a result, if we look at this example here, now this example actually has a database because the tie lock here can fail without reason, uh, causing me to go ahead and, and execute this assertion here even though this thread has not acquired the lock. So there's nothing to prevent the x equals 42 from executing in power with, uh, with the assertion. Uh, so as a result, this has a database. The compiler doesn't need to ensure any properties. And the compiler can go ahead and generate code that allows these things to appear out of order. The pro legitimate program can't tell the difference. Yeah. Um, is this uh, allowance for spurious failure of Trilock to, in order to enable compilers to make more optimizations? Uh, essentially, I mean, we don't actually expect compilers to, to use Trilock implementations that fail spuriously. Uh, on the other hand, by programming to this model, basically the programmer doesn't have to worry about sort of reordering some of these that really do occur in practice. So, uh, so another way to look at this actually that often convinces people that this actually makes sense is that uh, these spurious tie lock failures are essentially equivalent to having another thread around that's now and then acquiring the lock. You really don't want to write code that's not robust against that anyway. Because that means that if you write, debugging, write another debugging thread that watches the data and every once in a while acquires the lock, you will break the existing code. So that it outlaws a certain kind of really little code basically. Uh, let me see. Go. Okay. So I'll say something quickly about detached threads here. So detached threads are threads that basically sort of run to completion on their own that I'm not going to wait for anymore. Most threads APIs have a way of declaring a thread as detached, meaning that I don't have the runtime system no longer has to have the state around that allows me to wait for it to complete by call, typically by calling join on the thread. So it's, a, it's an unjoinable thread, essentially. Uh, this is something that's fairly pervasive in other threads APIs. POSIX has had it for, for quite a while. Uh, it turns out it actually has some surprising interactions with this and C++. So it seems like a natural enough concept 
but it's actually one that, that's much more dubious than one of Michael's thing. So here's a different version of the Fibonacci function that's written to explicitly create a thread, and rather than returning the and uh, rather than returning a future here, the, uh, the function run in the child pair here just assigns to, to fib one in the pair. Uh, so what happens, so this is all fine, this code works correctly normally. Uh, I have a child, uh, so in parallel I'm computing in the parent fib two and the child is computing fib one. These are both local variables in the parent thread and everything is okay. Uh, the problem is things go completely haywire <coughs> if I throw an exception where fib of n minus 2 is computed. Now what happens? Well, normally I end up waiting for the child pet before I look at the result fib 1 that it produces and everything is fine. In this case, I, can no, long I no longer end up waiting for it, so the, uh, the join call is not executed. The problem is, sort of with the traditional way of doing things, the, with the way this was, do it, this was done, for example, in boost threads, uh, when thread T is destroyed, the, now thread T is destroyed without having been joined. What should we do? So the, the way this was traditionally handled is we detach it at that point because the thread has been destroyed, so obviously we can't wait for it anymore. We have no way to wait for it anymore. That turns out to be the, the really the wrong behavior here. What happens in that case is with the child still running, we end up exiting this frame. We end up returning from that original call to fib. The child thread is now still writing to fib one in that frame. Uh, and potentially in the original parent thread, I end up making, executing other calls. I have new, new local variables on the, stack, on the stack. So suddenly my child thread is overriding a stack frame that's no longer there, which is sort of the ultimate example, of, the ultimate version of the example that Lawrence had of undebuggable code. You're never going to find this by, by debugging it. Uh, so this is something that we really don't want to do. So this is actually one place we ended up one of the places where we ended up deviating from existing practice. Uh, this is complicated, actually I'm so out of time. This is complicated actually by the fact that join also ends up working for the, waiting for the selectors of thread local variables. So there are other issues here. But so basically what, we, what happens in C++ 11 in order to address this issue, there are sort of various workarounds that allow me to, to implement detached threads which I would personally argue you never want to use, actually. You want to just call join on the thread. The rest of it is there for people who are sort of fanatically attached to detach, in my opinion. <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, we no longer implicitly detach when a thread object is destroyed, because that's incredibly error-prone and dangerous. So what we do instead is we basically view destroying a thread that hasn't been joined as an error, and we invoke terminate. Uh, so here's a quick summary slide. So there are a whole bunch of cases here in which we ended up with somewhat surprising results, I think for somewhat different reasons. So in the case of thread cancellation, I think the problem really was that there was no sort of fully backward compatible forward path and we couldn't agree on anything. Uh, for undefined infinite loops, in some sense the surprising behavior is something that actually was already there in the status quo, which is that many people didn't realize it was there. Uh, for a lot of the other problems here, basically we ended up with something different because the status quo actually wasn't really solid, wasn't, wasn't a sufficiently robust solution, and we needed something more robust that you could actually reason about. And that's it. For the, you're talking about the detached threads? Yeah, the detached threads. So I'm talking about the detached thread, but I think that uh, having 
okay, I, there are many, since this is a 30 minute talk, there's sort of many things I glossed over here. This may be something we should talk about after the fact. So I'm not sure I quite understood the question. Yeah. It is, we're not terminating a thread, we're terminating the whole process. It's not terminating that thread, it's uh, standard terminator. Okay. Uh, is there a way maybe uh, to use RAII to help solve this problem of an exception hash handed in the middle, like wrap the thread inside an object that uh, is the structure called join? Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly you could do that. And in fact, we discussed for a long time whether the thread destructor, destructor actually should call join rather than detach. I think that's actually, I still think that's a perfectly acceptable solution. Uh, it's more a philosophical difference. A lot of people didn't like that because you may, not, may end up waiting unexpectedly in places you didn't expect to. Uh, so uh, so the, the conclusion in the committee was that we should just consider it a bug essentially and just import it as an error rather than time you do something implicitly because it's not clear what the right action really is. Can you pass up the credits on an object? Certainly, pass the thread object. Uh, let me think about this. Uh, I mean, joining on uh, joining yourself is bound to deadlock, right? So that's not. <laughs> you can't really wait for yourself to finish. Uh, I mean, there are ways to mimic the, the the behavior. You can certainly just put the thread object in a static variable and just let it sit there and not destroy it for a long time. It will. I guess it will. You will. That's going to be a problem. Uh, well, I mean, you can basically put it in a heap uh, allocated object and just let it sit there and not deallocate it. And you can mimic the detached behavior and you will cause the same kinds of problems that you would have if you had detached. But you, actually, there is a detached primitive, so you don't need to do that. You can shoot yourself into the foot much more easily. But. Okay. Well, I thank the speaker for a... Surprisingly good talk. <laughs> <laughs>